Um, but hey, you, you don't want your kids to miss out on it. It's a great camp. If you want more information, all you got to do is just mark in the connection card, put your name on there, and put kids camp on there. We'd be happy to follow up and get your name on that list uh, because we really believe there is something. There's something about taking time away where God just does something really cool. And, and I don't know what it is, not to say that God doesn't work here because we absolutely believe that he does. But there's something about retreating to get away, especially when you're a young person. And, and those are memories that they'll never be able to recreate. And so uh, I just would really strongly encourage you, if you've got kids, to, to really consider going to that. But uh, we're halfway now through a series that we are calling Good Start, Good Heart. So if you're looking at the graphic right now, we're at the place of the person. So we are halfway through. And, and we've, we've used this series as a little bit of a springboard into our year because this is what people are talking about this time of year, right? It's, it's January, but we also know that it is the fourth week of January, so this is probably about that time where you've given up the idea of eating healthy and maybe going to the gym, and, and that's okay. That's okay because there's going to be next year. You can say it again. Um, but here's what I can tell you about your relationship with God is that there's, there's, it's always a good time to look at you, to look at him, and to say, okay, what do I need to do? And maybe you're here, and, there's, and if you were to think about your relationship with God, maybe you feel like there's some distance there. Maybe there was a season where you felt like you were closer, but right now you are, you're just not where you were. Here's what I can tell you if that is the case. He didn't move. And that oftentimes when there is distance between us and him, it's, it's a product of us. And so we've made this assumption in this series and we're carrying it throughout just so that we don't do that thing that we do where we make all these excuses. And, and this is the assumption that we're carrying. That since God is holy, this is going to create distance between us and him. And it's this, it's that the evil that you do comes from you. But if there's, if there's distance between us and God, if there's a struggle here, that it, it's, it's us. And you might think, okay, well that, well, that sounds kind of harsh. Well, I can just tell you that that that's absolutely the story of Scripture. Let me show you what the prophet Jeremiah said several years ago, and he said this about your heart. He says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And maybe you hear that and you think, well, Jeremiah might have been having a bad day. That doesn't sound like anything Jesus would say. Well, let me just show you what Jesus said, okay? And his authority comes out in all kinds of different ways. My very favorite way to see Jesus' authority come out is through offhanded statements, where he says things that you're like, wait, what? This is an example. This is Matthew chapter 7. And this is a passage we've preached on, and I don't know if you've caught it, okay? So he says, he says or which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts, or give good things to those who ask him? Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Let me just, can we, do we have the emphasis there? Can we add that, or I don't know? If you then, who are evil, notice what Jesus is talking about? He's not talking about humanity. He's talking about prayer. And he just kind of throws it in there. Like, that's a huge statement. Like, the people in the crowd probably didn't, all, all of them probably didn't believe it. He's not talking about humanity. And he just, like, throws it in his little sidebar. Hey, by the way, you're evil. <laughs> like, they had to be thinking what you're thinking. Like, wait, what? Are you sure? That doesn't sound like Jesus. No, absolutely doesn't sound like Jesus. And here's how we know this. We know this by just studying us, right? Like as much as we hate to admit it, we do things that we regret. And as hard as we try, there's still, like we're just not really always where we want to be. And, and oftentimes this comes out as we look at our emotions. 
Because what happens is we'll, we'll feel something, something will happen, an emotion will come out, and we'll realize, wow, I had no idea that was in there. And the one we're going to talk about this week, last week we talked about guilt, and the one that we're going to talk about this, this week is one that all of us would be embarrassed to admit that we have, but it is essential that we see it for what it is, because if we can, then we can actually do something, and that is jealousy. That, that no one here wants to admit that they're jealous like, because to admit that is essentially an admission of someone has something better than you, and we live in a society that is very competitive. I mean, if you don't believe me, just scroll Facebook, right? Like, all that is is a tool to feed humanity's jealousy, because cause only, we only get the cliff notes on Facebook, we never get the whole story. And what it does is it feeds this thing inside of us and if we can't learn how to deal with it, when jealousy comes out, it can be particularly embarrassing and even, even devastating if we don't catch it. So what we're doing for this series is we're using Andy Stanley's book, Enemies of the Heart, as our framework, and then we're just kind of building on his framework. And so I want to I start by asking the question, okay, so why, why are we jealous? Like, why do we feel jealousy? And, and, and here, here, here's why. We feel jealousy ultimately because we think that God owes us something. That jealousy's assumption is that God owes me. And, and if we were to really look at jealousy, okay, and if we were to boil it down, it, if we, we could take it all the way back to the Ten Commandments. And the, the root behind what comes out of our jealousy is something that Moses mentioned a long time ago when he gave the Ten Commandments from God. And the root of it is a biblical word called coveting. And oftentimes the reason why we feel jealous is because in our heart of hearts, we are coveting something. Let me read to you Moses talking here in Exodus chapter 20. He says this. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. I don't know if anyone's coveting any oxes today, but... We all probably have seen that. See, we, we, all, we all drove by a donkey on our way here. And we thought, I like that. So other than, but, but the principle is this, is that, that there's, there's something that belongs to someone else. And when we see it, we say, yeah, I'd like that. And, and when that's left unchecked, jealousy builds. Jealousy grows. And, and the assumption that we have to deal with is that the reason why we feel that deep down is because we think that God owes us something that we don't have. And if you're here and that sounds kind of harsh, well, let me just kind of unpack it for you a little bit. If you're here and you're a Christian, you believe that everything comes from him. Everything good comes from him, right? And, and even if you're here and you're like a hardcore Arminian that doesn't like to give God a lot of credit, I mean, could, you could acknowledge that the things in your life that happen, I mean, ultimately, in one way or another, God could have stepped in and done something. And so when you look at the things in your life and you're frustrated with what you have, deep down, your frustration is with God, who gives all things. I mean, if we were to trace everything back, we would trace it back to him. Look at what Jesus' brother says. In James chapter 1, verse 17, he says this. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, 
coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And if everything that comes from him, if everything comes from him, and we're frustrated, then he's who we're frustrated with. Now, thinking about jealousy, we get, let's be honest, we can get jealous about all kinds of things. It's not just stuff, but sure, certainly stuff can be something that brings it out. Maybe, maybe you work at a company, and you're realizing that someone you work with is getting noticed more than you are. And that's hard for you. Maybe, maybe they ended up getting that promotion that you wanted. And that, that's hard to bring something out inside of you. Now, don't raise your hand for this one, but maybe you're, you're sitting here and you're married, and you're, you're looking at your spouse, and you're thinking, man, I wish they were more like that person. And you think, gosh, and, and you, you compare them to this other person, and you're just like, man, if I, if I had that, and you're jealous. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's, it's your kids. And you discover that your kids, they, you thought they were really, really good at this thing. And then you watch someone else's kid do that thing that you thought your kid was really good at, and you realize there was someone out there that was better. And it does something inside of you. It's, it's hard. Maybe, maybe you, you, you're invited over to a, a co-worker's house, someone in your field, and you, you put their address in your GPS, pulled up a picture of the house, and you thought, I had no idea they were that far along. And I've always thought that I worked way harder than they did. How in the world did that happen? <laughs> All those are things that we feel. We're looking at something that God has given someone else, and we're, we're frustrated. And this is what happens over time, because we don't like to admit that we're jealous. We don't want to, we don't want to blame God, because, well, I mean, he's God. And so instead of admitting that we're jealous, instead of asking God why that's the case, what we do is we make these incredible excuses, which if we were to, like, just put them out over time, we would realize they actually sound pretty ridiculous. Like to that person who got that, who got that promotion that you wanted. You say things like, well, I mean... They, they only got that promotion because of their family. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe to, um, to, to just like, as, you're, as it, you're like not getting noticed at work, and so you say things like, well, yeah, no one notices me because I just put my nose down and I do my job, and I ain't sucking up to anybody. As you watch the, the kid who's advancing at a, a faster rate than your kid, you say, well, yeah, the, the only reason why they are advancing is because they work with them all the time. And excuse me, I want my kid to have a childhood. And to that house, the, the coworker who's further along, you say, well, yeah, they just happened. They just happened to be at the right place at the right time. It's not that they're, that they're actually better than me. And that's what we do. Instead of, instead of dealing with the issue, we make all these excuses. <clears throat> and, and as we make these excuses, what we're doing is we're building a wall around our hearts that can be so strong that it's really difficult for God to penetrate it. And I hate to admit it, but I'll be honest, I'm a person who would say, yeah, absolutely I have, said, I have said those things before. And here's what I can tell you, is that as I have said them, when that was my means for coping with my jealousy, it never healed my heart. It never made anything better. It actually just was it me strung, stringing along frustration? 
And not only that, but it caused me to, to miss the joy of the places where I was. I was thinking about m- my career when it started. And, um, and I really, it started at a really good place. I, I remember when I was in Bible college, and it was a senior seminar. And um, there's probably 30, 35 people in our class. And, and they were like, all right, a lot of you guys are going into the workforce in a few weeks. Raise your hand if you have a job. And I was like one of four people who was able to raise their hand. That's probably why that school was shut down. But, <laughs> but that was a really good one. It just came to me. <laughs> but I, 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 was able to, I was able to have a job where most of the people I went to school with didn't. And I got, I got hired at a really great situation. that The church just started a year prior. And, and they were doing so well that, that they actually were able to hire a full-time youth pastor one year after they started. And in church world, that's crazy. The, the things we were able to see happen there, that my first Sunday, there was about 180 people in attendance. My last Sunday, there would have been probably around 300 to 350 people in attendance that I was able to see things happen there that were crazy. I mean, I got to watch a building campaign happen, that we moved into this old lighting place and turned into a church, and it was really cool. That I saw, I saw so many people get baptized. Like, there, there was a youth night. It was in December, and I just remember it was in December because it was really cold outside, where we baptized 20 kids from the high school across the street. Like, it was nuts. The, the, I, I was even having lunch with a guy this week, and I was talking about, I've never seen a church make the kind of difference in a community that that church made in the time that we were there. It was incredible. Like, we had the superintendent of school showing up at our services wondering what was going on. And, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, when, I was, when I was there, when I was living it, I was super proud of what I was able to be part of. That was until I realized that one of the guys I graduated with was regularly preaching at a mega church. And it's, I mean, it, that, until that moment, I was like, this is cool. Yeah, look at my, my resume is looking strong. And then, and then I noticed that this guy is getting these opportunities. He went to school with me. And, and I can tell you, I made all of those excuses. That I said all of those things. And, and what could have actually been a cool moment became something that was really frustrating for me because I kept looking at what, what God had given someone else instead of appreciating where he, where he put me. And I'm telling you, I made all the excuses. I would even, I got this chip on my shoulder like, well, yeah, I'm a self-made man. He, he's getting asked to speak on these, uh, these really cool conferences and serve on these really great committees, and, and I'm scheduling bowling trips in Lake of the Ozarks. And, and, and all I would do is I would just use that to fuel this thing inside of me to make me feel better about myself when really... What I needed to do was I needed to admit that I was jealous. And it wasn't until I was able to do that that God was really able to to start helping me sustain joy. And, and, And I would guess that if you're here, there's probably something in your life that would fall into that category. And, and even if you're like at a place where you really actually think that you are the best at everything, we'll talk about pride in a little bit, but here's the thing. Even if that's, th- there's always going to be something that you could point at and be jealous about. And so what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about kind of my journey as to how I dealt with it. And I can tell you that while it's still a thing that maybe I struggle with from time to time, that I do believe that God has given me freedom in it. And so I want to look at at how we do that. And so if you've got a Bible, we're going to be in James chapter 3. And I just, it, this shows a picture of what happens 
when jealousy takes over. Look at this, James chapter 3, verse 13. He says this, he says, Who is wise in understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. <laughs> I think it's funny that there are quotes there. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. If you don't get your jealousy in check, you will find disorder and evil practice. But if you think that your jealousy is a good motivation for you, James would say that's not wisdom. He would say that's demonic. So it is something that, that is worth dealing with. So what do we do? Based on this text, what do we do? How do we fight jealousy? There's a couple things we do. First off is this. Is that you need to pray humbly. That if you, if you have it in you, and if we ultimately believe that everything comes from him, then you start with praying humbly. And now maybe you think, well, I'm not happy. I believe that everything came. So you're just telling me to tell God everything that I am frustrated with that he has not given me. That doesn't sound like humility. That sounds like pride. Yeah. But there's something very humbling and very humble about acknowledging that, well, it all does come from him. And if you, if you take the time to pray and to talk, it's, it's humble because you're saying, well, God, I believe that all of this is from you. And, and then as you humbly pray and you talk to God about what you're feeling inside of your heart, I mean, start with all the emotions that are there. Let me tell him, say, God, why didn't you give me But then eventually, I think that the more that you talk, the more that the walls will come down. And, and the less that it's going to be anger that comes out and anger that you feel, but you're going to find yourself being incredibly vulnerable the more that you do. So maybe we'll start by saying, God, why didn't you give me blank? It could turn into the heart of the issue, and it's that God, I feel stupid that I don't have this. That God, because you've given that to them and not to me, and I know that it all comes from you, I just, honestly, God, it kind of feels like you don't love me as much as you love them. That's, like, that's the root of it, isn't it, if you believe that it all comes from him? And I'll be honest, it's super hard to admit that. But if we can get to that place, then we will find, we'll find healing. And, and, and if you notice, if you, last week we talked about this with guilt. Man, it, you, you might as well just tell God everything that you're thinking. I think that we think that we can hide things from him. I mean, Adam and Eve thought they could. <laughs> but there, he, he, he sees the depths of your heart. Like those feelings that you have, like you can not talk to him about them, but he, he absolutely sees that they're there. Like you can try to make it all flowery, or whatever, but, but he, he sees what's there, so why not just be honest with him about what's going on? And if you want to find healing, that's really where you start. And even if you notice this theme from last week to this week, that we absolutely believe that God is the healer, that he's the one who does the work. 
but if you want him to do the work, you've got to be willing to spend time in his presence. Like, so many of our answers are, well, you need to talk to God about that. Well, you need, you need to be vulnerable. And here's the thing. If you're not spending time in his presence, then you're not going to find the answer. Like, that's why what we do here is so important. That, that we believe that we are in the presence of God. His word is being taught. That we are worshiping in a community here. We, you can't recreate that at home. That there, there is value in what is happening because if we spend time in the presence of God, he does things in our hearts. Maybe even right now you're like, man, I really am jealous. What do you think that is? That is the presence of God working on your heart, showing you something you need to deal with. But it's not just here. It's also daily. That we're saying if, if God is the one who can help us with these emotions, then we need to make daily time in his presence part of our rhythm and our routine that might mean that you need to put it on your calendar that might mean that you need to set an alarm that might mean before you go to bed you need to tell your spouse i'm gonna pray don't let me in until 10 minutes have passed whatever the case may be if we're saying hey pray humbly talk to him about what you're going through that's where you find it but you're saying and I'll give him some passing things from here and there. Well, then you're not gonna you're not gonna get what you need. You don't cultivate a relationship like that, but you cultivate them intentionally. So you pray humbly. Second thing that you do as you struggle with jealousy is that you don't deny the truth. That you don't deny the truth. What's the truth? You're jealous. That's the truth. And look at what James says here. He says, if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Boasting about it, that could be like that chip on that shoulder. Or you say, everyone thinks they're better, but I'm going to show them. Like that's, that's boasting about your jealousy. And, if, and what is the truth about selfish ambition? Like, notice, it doesn't say ambition is wrong. It's selfish ambition that's wrong. What does selfish ambition care about? It cares about being noticed. It's not about, it's not about what you're going to do. It, 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 it's all about you. And if you really were to boil selfish ambition down to a sentence, it's that you want people to be jealous of you. And because they're not, you're jealous of them. And James is saying, when that is the case, don't boast about it, don't deny the truth, but acknowledge it for what it is. You're frustrated, you're jealous, you're being selfish. Because what do we know about the truth? The truth will set us free. It's kind of in the spirit of that, I want to give you a few truths about jealousy. As we wrestle with this and we process it, the first one is this. Oftentimes the people that you're jealous of, they didn't realize they were competing with you. Sometimes they do. Most of the time they don't. All those mental conversations that you have where you are trying to one-up them in your brain, they have no idea, and if they found out, you would be really embarrassed. They didn't realize it. Another truth about jealousy. If the people you were jealous of gave you what they had that you wanted, it wouldn't make anything any better. It wouldn't. You think that, like, I mean, seriously, that guy who has that house that you want, if he were to say, I had no idea you loved my house so much. Why don't we just trade? You're telling me that rage wouldn't boil inside of you, and you would say something like, who do they think they are? I don't take handouts. I don't need their pity, their pity. No, I'm fine, I'm going to earn, like, come on, like, you're, it's not going to make things any better. And oftentimes, the things that we're jealous about people about are things they can't give us anyways. But yet, we, make, we get so mad. Here's another thing. You think you deserve what they have more than they do. 
you think you deserve it more. I mean, think about their family. Think about the work that they've put in. Think about the challenges that they've faced by having that thing that you want. You think that you deserve it more than they do. And then finally here, this is true about jealousy, it's this. It isn't that you're frustrated with what you have. You're frustrated that they have more or they have better. And nothing will rob you of joy like comparison. Jealousy, it's rarely about what we have. It's just that it's hard that they have something that's better or that we want. And the truth will set us free. And as we acknowledge those things, man, it's, it's really hard to acknowledge those things in your heart and not move to a place of repentance. And we talked about this last week, but repentance is admitting that you're wrong with the desire to change. Because I would bet this, that if in your heart of hearts you're saying you deserve what you have more than some, what, what, what you deserve, you deserve more than what someone else has. You gonna double down on that in the presence of the one who made him? You gonna, you gonna hold on to that in the presence of God? No, what's gonna happen is it's gonna lead you to confess and to repent and to want to change. And that's how the truth sets us free. And finally, and this one is the, the last thing I would say that we do is we, is we struggle jealousy. And this one's hard initially. But I'm telling you that this, this is good. So, what, so the assumption is that God owes us something. We, we don't deny the truth. We kind of embrace it. And then we just we ask God to forgive us and let him do work. And then this is, this is the third thing is that you need to celebrate the success of others. That you need to, the people, you, you need to celebrate the success of others. And kind of in the spirit of not denying the truth, we can acknowledge. Why are we jealous? Jealous because someone has something better than us, because someone has something that we want, that we think it's... So, so for us, you want to you get through that, you want to fight that, you need to learn to celebrate their success. You need to tell them how great their thing is that you want. That if their kid really is better than your kid at that thing, you need to tell them how impressive it is that their kid is good at that thing. You need to tell them how they're on a really good road if they keep that up and they're gonna be really successful in their lives. That person that lives in your dream house, you need to tell them how much you like their house. You, You need to tell them that, hey, if I ever get the opportunity to build, I'm gonna use your house as an inspiration for the one that I want. But that person that has that job that you wanted, you should tell them how prestigious it is. If they're doing something and they're doing something in that position and they do a good job in that position, you should tell them they did a good job. Not only should you tell them, you should tell others that they did a good job. And maybe you hear me say all that and you say, well, Ryan, I thought lying was a sin. Well, well, nothing I said, nothing I said was a lie. Their kid really is great at that thing. That really is the house that you want. The job really is prestigious, and they actually did do a good job. And, and hear me, if you, if you think that is true, and you can't bring yourself to compliment them, that is a problem because lying is a sin. And what that does is it reveals something in our hearts. And so we've got to learn to celebrate the success of other people. And here's what I've found. It doesn't work 100% of the time, but it usually, it eventually follows, is that my heart follows my actions. That over time, the more that I do it, the more that I can honestly say, that I genuinely can root for those people who I initially was jealous of. That's what God does. So you acknowledge, okay, it's the issues with you and with God. Don't deny the truth, and then celebrate the success 
of other people. And here's what I'm going to tell you. It's good news. It's actually really bad news. That even as you do that, there's still going to be situations where jealousy is going to creep up. There's still going to be things in life where you're going to think that you were the best and you're going to realize that you're not. But let me show you something good as I close. This is Philippians chapter 4. Oftentimes what people do with Philippians 4 is they read verse 13 on an island. And when they read it on an island, it actually feeds our jealousy. We'll say thing, because it's this, it's like, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we read that on an island, and we look at things that we want, and we don't get what we want, and we say, well, I thought I, I could do all things through him who strengthens me, right? Why don't I have this thing? I thought, I thought it said I could do all things. But let me give you the context behind it, and I think the context behind it is far more powerful than, than this idea that we just get whatever we want. Paul says this, he says, I've learned in whatever situation to be content. I know how to be brought low. He's like, I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it is to abound. In any, in every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I, yeah, there are going to always be people that have more. There are going to be seasons in my life where I feel like I have a lot. But I can get through both through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Thank you for watching our services. If you have questions or you would like more information, you can visit us online at nlspringfield.com. We'd also love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning services. We have programs at 9.30 and 11 for adults, students, and kids. We hope to see you there.